The Stone Date Meets DMT, a second look at evolutionary perspectives. We have an unsolved mystery in terms of how the human brain came to be. Roughly two million years ago, there was an unexplained leap in the size of the brain of our ancestors. This leads me to the Stone Ape Theory of Evolution. It's based on the notion that our ancestors consumed psilocybin mushrooms, which then led to the growth of our cortex and our growth in consciousness as a whole. The man who came up with this theory was Terence McKenna, one of the most famous psychonauts of all time, more recently propagated by his brother Dennis McKenna. Shout out to you, Dennis. Love you, man. As well as leading mycologists of today, Paul Stamets. So the Stone Ape Theory of Evolution is based upon the notion that 23 different species of primates, including humans, consume mushrooms of various types, not just psilocybin. In addition, climate change induced our hunter-gatherer ancestors to leave the forest and begin foraging in the savanna. Hunting entails looking for footprints, scat, or fecal matter, which psilocybin just happens to grow on. And psilocybin substitutes as serotonin, inducing neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Neurogenesis being the growth of new brain cells, neuroplasticity being alterations to neural pathways. In addition, the human brain doubled in size 2 million to 200,000 years ago. And with this doubling in brain size came the ability to utilize language and plan for the future. Psilocybin experiences increased empathy and reduced fear in our ancestors, which eventually led to leadership skill sets. And this evolutionary process took place over millions of years, leading to epigenetic neurogenesis. So much of these concepts surrounding the Stone Ape theory sound rather plausible, knowing the fact the, the mechanisms of action regarding psilocybin and the type of experiences that they can induce. However, there are some loose ends that I think we should consider. It's believed that our ancestors originated in the African forest and then migrated to the savanna based on climate change where psilocybin mushrooms were much more plentiful, which led to our evolution. From the savanna, they migrated towards Asia and parts of Europe, and eventually the Americas. However, recent research indicates that our human ancestors inhabited the Americas at a much earlier time than once was thought, uh, literally over 100,000 years earlier. So we have to remain cognizant that there's a lot about human history that we don't know, especially dating uh, that far back. One of the concepts in terms of the loose ends is that if our ancestors inhabited the Americas at a much earlier time, uh, were, were psilocybin mushrooms available throughout various parts of North, Central, and South America, being that the terrain was very different than that of the savanna. So it's just something to think about. It doesn't disqualify the Stone Ape theory at all. It just uh, you know makes some food for thought in terms of the consistency of the abundance and the accessibility. Psilocybin mushrooms would have to be in close proximity to all our ancestors, regardless of where they were located geographically, whatever terrain they were located in. So these are just some things to think about in terms of our evolution. So in terms of some points to ponder, the distribution, accessibility, and consistency of ingestion, as well as the dosing, not enough dosing, and you're not going to have the subsequent effects of growth of the cortex, and too much dosing, and you might have incapacitation leading us vulnerable to predators like this guy. So the question is, is there an easier way in terms of this evolutionary process? This brings me to DMT, another psychedelic compound with, that's been known to induce neurogenesis as well as neuroplasticity. And then there's 5-MeO-DMT, which has also been known to induce neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. And then bufotenine, which is a lesser known DMT, a 5-hydroxy-DMT, which is brought to my attention by a fellow named Jeff Frame at the recent Tieringham event, in which he presented this case study by Jonathan Ott regarding the effects of bufotenine. Ott would claim that bufotenine was on par with 5-MeO-DMT in terms of power and four to five times stronger than regular DMT. So this alludes to the notion that bufotenine can also induce neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. This is Dr. Stephen Barker, one of the most knowledgeable DMT researchers of all time. Shout out to you, Dr. Barker, for your great work. In 2012, he would do this write-up study regarding 69 human studies measuring the levels of DMT, bufotenine, and 5-MeO-DMT in blood, urine, and cerebral spinal fluid of humans. This brings me to ayahuasca. The ayahuasca brew is comprised of the bee cappy vine and plants that contain uh, DMT. Here's an image of the bee cappy vine which contains beta carbolines that act as monamine oxidase inhibitors, allowing for the DMT in the Psychotria viridis plant, Mimosa hostilis plant, 
or any other DMT containing plant to remain orally active, which allows for it to have visionary effects that last for hours rather than minutes. What's interesting is that one of the beta carbolines found in the B. cappy vine is named harmine, which can induce neurogenesis within its cell. Even more interesting is the fact that harmine seems to be produced endogenously within humans. This brings me to the concept of endowaska, or endogenous ayahuasca. What's interesting is that, aside from harmine, it seems as though the body produces multiple monamine oxidase inhibitors, such as tribulin, neurocadin, and pinaline. So in essence, the endowaska system is a more complex version of ayahuasca to a certain extent, and we all happen to possess this magical blend of chemicals within all of us. To be fair, I'd like to cite some non-psychoactive, non-psychedelic compounds that seem to be produced within the mammalian brain that could have very well played a role in terms of the growth of our cortex. Uh, compounds such as brain-derived neurotropic factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, nerve growth factor, as well as melatonin. I think it's just fair to go ahead and cite these. We don't have to get too nerdy about it, but there are non-psychoactive compounds that could also induce uh, concepts like neurogenesis as well as neuroplasticity. In the year 2000, DMT, the spirit molecule, was released, positing that it was the pineal gland that was the source of DMT in the mammalian brain. However, it wasn't until 2013 when a study at Jimo Borjigan's lab at the University of Michigan actually found DMT at the site of the pineal gland. A few years later, there was a critique paper questioning whether the pineal gland could produce physiologically relevant amounts of DMT. And in 2019, Dr. John Dean, shout out to you, Y-Town, uh, produced this paper, which basically changed the course of endogenous DMT discussion altogether. He found that DMT was found at levels similar to that of serotonin and dopamine in the extracellular fu fluid of the mammalian brain. So as you can see here in the middle column, compared to serotonin and dopamine, DMT is very similar in terms of the, the range. And in terms of average concentration, it falls right in between serotonin and dopamine. So if we want to remain consistent in terms of serotonin being extremely important in terms of mood modulation and dopamine being important in terms of pleasure modulation, uh, DMT would seem to have some sort of very important effect in terms of modulating our normal waking reality. We still haven't figured out exactly why we produce DMT. In addition, Dean found the enzyme necessary to synthesize DMT at various parts of the mammalian brain. One of these sites was the cerebral cortex, which is extremely important, being that the cerebral cortex comprises of 80% of the mass volume of the human brain. In addition, he found the enzyme at the choroid plexus, which is intriguing, being that the choroid plexus is the site of cerebral spinal fluid production in the brain, with cerebral spinal fluid being a potential medium of distribution for neurotransmitters as well as DMT. The enzyme was also found at the visual cortex, obviously where visual processing takes place, as well as the hippocampus where learning and memory takes place, as well as the pineal gland. So in terms of some points to ponder, uh, comparing that to psilocybin, in terms of the distribution, accessibility, and consistency of ingestion, it seems like we would have that covered, being that these compounds are found endogenous within the mammalian system. The real question is, what would be the dosing? What would be the catalyst to upregulate these molecules within us to drive the evolutionary growth of the cortex? I doubt that our ancestors had access to a crystal ball to see thousands of years in the future, practicing Wim Hof method or meditation that are hypothesized to upregulate the endowaska system. However, there was a study in 2019 out of Caltech that found that humans can sense Earth's magnetic field similar to many other animals. And there was a 2021 review paper looking at the effects of hypomagnetic fields. That means very, very weak magnetic fields looking at space exploration. And they found that there was a distinct alterations in our nervous system based on these hypomagnetic fields. And in 2022, there was a study out of South Korea that found def definitively that humans do have some sort of magnetic sense. So I'm positing that it's Earth's magnetic field that acts as a catalyst to upregulate our endowaska system and driving our evolutionary processes. An example of magnetic field effects on our neurology would be transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS for short. Uh, TMS has been around since the 1980s, so it's nothing new, just not super well known in the mainstream. It works by creating a magnetic field that penetrates the skull and changes our neurology in the form of neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, 
alterations to our brainwave frequencies, alterations to our neurotransmitter concentrations. Being that there's a tight relationship between magnetic fields and electricity, we believe that it's highly plausible that magnetic fields from TMS are altering the electrical impulses, which then drive alterations in the neurotransmitter release. However, it's not that simple, being that the strength of Earth's magnetic field when compared to TMS is not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Uh, just for example, these are the various field strengths when measured via a different Tesla. Looking at different Tesla measurements, one Tesla equating to a million micro Tesla. This is a 2006 paper published in Nature magazine, which looked at the magnetic field strength of the Earth, and they found that at the equator it was 25 micro Teslas, and at the poles it was 75 micro Teslas. So TMS strength operating at 1 to 5, 1.5 to 3 Teslas. The geomagnetic range of the Earth is 25 to 75 micro Teslas. So TMS strength is 30,000 to 100,000 fold stronger than the geomagnetic range of the Earth. So the question is whether there is any evidence indicating that stimulation of the human brain at the micro Tesla range can have any sort of effect on our neurology. This brings me to Dr. Michael Persinger's work, rest in peace. He was a Canadian researcher that looked extensively at the effects of magnetic fields on uh, the human brain and our consciousness as a whole. He's one of the co-founders of this device called the God Helmet, which is utilized to induce altered states of consciousness. It was called the God Helmet because people would uh, regularly describe a sense of a presence of another sort of being of sorts. So the God Helmet operated by utilizing a rotating magnetic field that rotated counterclockwise at 1 to 5 micro Tesla strength. Uh, this seems to fall somewhere within the range of Earth's magnetic field range of 25 to 75 micro Tesla. This video here is of a Skeptic Magazine founder, Dr. Michael Shermer, and his experience with the God Helmet. Helmet time, Nicole. Easy rider. Dr. Persinger's next volunteer, me. While being wired and blindfolded, I have plenty of time to reflect on what I am about to experience. A very sensitive part of my brain called the temporal lobes, located on either side just above my ears, is about to be bombarded with a series of electromagnetic pulses. The pulses will assault both my memory and my ability to unscramble information collected from my five senses. My brain is about to attempt to make sense of some very distorted signals. See you in a bit. Okay. I sit in the dark in perfect silence for nearly an hour. And yes, even a skeptic's mind can start to play tricks on him. I feel a presence rush by me. In fact, I'm not sure that it wasn't me running past myself. I know it sounds crazy, but I really did sense that someone was in the room with me, courtesy of the magnetic influences being created on my temporal lobes. What's happening to Michael now is he's being exposed to uh, complex magnetic fields. The pulse being generated is that which is associated with opiate-like experiences such as floating and pleasantness and spinning sometimes. Halfway through my hour of isolation, the computer begins generating a markedly darker experience for my brain. At this point, there is now another pattern being generated. It's primarily being generated along the right hemisphere, which means it tends to be more associated with more terrifying experiences. That's right, folks. He said, terrifying. Under these conditions, volunteers have reported meeting the devil, being grabbed by aliens, even being transported to hell. At the end of the hour, I could honestly report that temporal lobe stimulation had been responsible for not only a sensed presence, but an out-of-body experience as well. This is interesting in light of Michael Shermer being a skeptic and the magnetic field of the God Helmet being at such a, a weak uh, strength and it's still induce a mystical type of effect such as an out-of-body experience. So something to think about. In 2003, Dr. Michael Persinger would write a hypothesis paper regarding the proposed mechanism of action of inducing these altered states of consciousness with the God Helmet regarding DMT increased uh, release from the pineal gland. In terms of the brainwave frequencies altered by the God Helmet, uh, Persinger would write a 2004 write-up regarding the increases in the gamma power range over various parts of the brain. This is intriguing in light of vaporized DMT having similar increases in the gamma power and that this gamma power increases correlated with the mystical type experiences. 
Similar increases were seen following the ingestion or the vaporization of 5-MeO-DMT regarding gamma power, and similar effects were seen following the ingestion of ayahuasca. So to summarize, you have the God Helmet strength operating at 1 to 5 microteslas, the geomagnetic range of the Earth between 25 to 75 microteslas. So it would seem to roughly fall within the range of Earth's magnetic field strength. This here is a 2015 write-up uh, that's not related to the God Helmet, but it, it, it does operate within a 2 microtesla range, which is similar to the strength of the God Helmet. They exposed live rats for 2 to 5 days to a 2 microtesla magnetic field strength. And they saw an increase in terms of serotonin, dopamine, and nitric oxide. Just for some perspective, Algernon Pharmaceuticals is a company out of Canada, which is looking at the effects of sub-psychedelic levels of DMT in terms of uh, neuroprotective and neurogenesis effects. They saw that there was significant growth with concentrations of DMT as low as 100 picomolar. Just for some perspective, 100 picomolar equates to 0.1 nanomolar. Uh, the extracellular DMT level range in the 2019 John Dean study was between 0.25 to 2.2. So 0.1 nanomolar would be a 5% fluctuations in DMT. I think this sounds completely reasonable in terms of endogenous D DMT fluctuations. In terms of daily geomagnetic fluctuations, going back to the 2006 uh, Nature paper, they found during normal uh, times of the Earth that the Earth's magnetic field fluctuates uh, 25 uh, nanoteslas in strength. However, during geomagnetic storms, uh, we've seen a vast uh, difference in terms of the fluctuations in the field as high as 300 and 400 nanoteslas per minute. And in some cases, it gets even more extreme where you're seeing 1,000 to 4,000 nanotesla fluctuations per minute. So this falls well within the range of the God Helmet. And there is some evidence indicating that geomagnetic storms can have an influence on the human brain measured via EEG, uh, effects on our, our behavior such as increased suicide rates, even things like hallucinations, or even um, hospitalizations via depression during a geomagnetic storm. So we have to realize that uh, Earth is not a petri dish, it's not stagnant, similar to the human body. Earth is in motion just like the human body is in motion. Even plants are consistently moving even though we don't notice them because it's so subtle. We don't need to get knocked over the head with a hammer to know that something is actually taking place. Now we have ultra-weak magnetic field stimulation. This is the picotesla range. So this is a 1994 uh, study regarding a 5-picotesla stimulation in rats. And they found that there was a direct correlation of melatonin production based on this 5-picotesla magnetic field stimulation. This brings us to 1-picotesla transcranial magnetic stimulation. In epileptic patients, they saw that there was an enhancement of the delta and theta wave frequency following this one picotesla stimulation. Similar effects have been seen in multiple sclerosis patients, Alzheimer's patients, Parkinson's disease, uh, cerebral palsy, as well as autism. So ultra-weak TMS takes place at one picotesla range. A geomagnetic flux on a daily is at 25 nanoteslas during the regular environment of the Earth. However, during geomagnetic storms, you can have as high as four microtesla fluctuations. So here at the bottom, you have uh, what would be the equivalent 25 nanoteslas on a regular basis would be a 25,000 picotesla fluctuation on a daily basis. And du during geomagnetic storms, you have uh, four microteslas equating to four million picoteslas. So what we're looking at, I believe, is nonlinear effects. A uh, linear effect would mean that the greater increase in magnetic field strength would automatically equate to a greater effect size. And it's simply not the case. If that were the case, theoretically, you could just take advantage of the magnetic field of your refrigerator and level up like Mario, but that's simply not the case. There's been various research papers showcasing the fact that these are nonlinear effects in terms of the magnetic field and in regards to our physiology. This review paper looks upon dozens upon dozens of magnetic field studies in terms of this nonlinear effect. And they cite the fact that you could have greater magnetic field strength with actually a decrease in effect size and a decreased magnetic field strength with a greater effect size. In terms of the magnetic field generated endogenously by the human brain, it seems to operate within the femtotesla range. So just to recap, you have strong TMS that takes place at the Tesla range, which isn't really pertinent in terms of our discussion regarding evolution. 
You have Earth's field, which operates between 25 to 75 microteslas. You have the God helmet, which operates at the, the 1 to 5 microtesla range. Then you have geomagnetic flux uh, during storms uh, that can operate w within the nanotesla range all the way up to the 1 to 4 microtesla range. And then you have weak TMS, which takes place at the picotesla range. So it seems as though you could have a wide range of naturally generated uh, geomagnetic fluctuations that could have some sort of effect on our neurology. So now back to the catalyst. This is a 2019 write-up in Nature magazine discussing the fact that Earth's magnetic field has been weakening uh, due to magnetic North Pole moving about 35 miles per year. Even airports have had to rename their runways based on this shift of magnetic North Pole. Uh, the reason for this movement in magnetic North Pole is cited to be because of some moving blobs. In reality, it's based on the molten iron core moving in Earth's outer core. Uh, this has been outlined in this study here. As you can see here in 1999, the shape of the blobs were a little bit different compared to that of 2019, and this drives the, the movement of magnetic north. This write-up in 2019, Smithsonian Magazine cited the fact that over the last 2.6 million years, Earth's magnetic field has flipped 10 times and nearly flipped more than 20 times during events called excursions. Excursions being short-lived episodes when Earth's magnetic field deviates into an intermediate polarity state. So they're not full flips, they're partial flips, but the Earth's magnetic field is greatly affected in the process. One of the most well-studied excursions is the Lachamp geomagnetic excursion, which took place over 440 years, and then it reversed the excursion in about 250 years. So that's pretty fast in terms of the movement of the poles and reversing this effect. So this chart is of this study, of the Lachamp event, it goes from right to left for whatever reason. On the right is 50,000 years ago, and on the left is 38,000 years ago. The Lachamp event taking place around 40,000 years ago. As you can see, even leading up to the Lachamp event, there was wild gyrations in the paleo intensity, the geomagnetic uh, fluctuations. And that's really what we're looking for in terms of potentiality to induce changes in terms of our evolution. Because it's a nonlinear uh, magnetic effect, we're not necessarily looking for stronger magnetic fields or weaker magnetic fields. We're looking for a wide gyration. And it seems as though leading up to the excursion, you can have these wild gyrations, which could potentially drive uh, changes in our, in our neurology. So the question now, is there any evidence of geomagnetic effects on evolution? Uh, the Arabidopis thaliana plant is a plant that's similar to a lab rat. It's a plant that they commonly use in terms of studying plants. And they have found geomagnetic effects in terms of the gene expression of this plant, as well as the iron uptake, root and mineral nutrition uh, differences based on the geomagnetic field, lipid metabolism, fruit growth suppression, as well as flowering time. So in addition to the magnetic field evolutionary pathway, there's two additional ones. This is a write-up in Science Magazine outlining the effects of the Lachamp excursion. They saw that with the depletion of Earth's magnetic field, there was also a depletion in the ozone layer, which led to an increase in ultraviolet ray flux. So the second evolutionary pathway that emerges is ultraviolet adaptation response. We've seen this in terms of UVB rays uh, increase and adaptation response in various plants. Uh, part of this adaptation response is based on the quick activation of the antioxidant system in order to deal with this increase in UVB radiation intensity, increased flavonoids, increased antioxidants. This is a 2005 study regarding the Psychotria viridis plant, a plant that's well known to contain DMT and utilized in the ayahuasca brew. The researchers would look at the circadian rhythm of DMT in the leaves of this plant, and they did see a circadian rhythm. They saw that the levels peaked at the hottest times of the day, and they saw that the DMT actually contains a specific affinity for UVB radiation. The authors posited that it's potential that DMT levels increase to protect itself, protect the plant from the solar radiation. This is a write-up by my friend Eat Fresca. Shout out to you regarding your research regarding the neuroprotective effects of DMT in the, the mammalian system and the antioxidant capabilities of DMT in the mammal. So the question now is what about humans? Is there any evidence indicating that any of these geomagnetic effects or UV ray effects can have any effect on humans? We already outlined the, 
the Caltech study from 2019, the Hypomagnetic Review paper, the 2022 Magnetic Sense study, as well as all the geomagnetic uh, storm effects on our, our neurology. However, there's additional research indicating that there can be a synchronization of the autonomic nervous system with geomagnetic activity. There could be an alteration in hormonal secretion, in this case, melatonin secretion based on geomagnetic activity. And we can have a synchronization with Earth's magnetic field. In addition, the humans can have an adaptation response to UV radiation. This isn't only the skin. It can also affect the endocrine system, which would affect our hormones. So there's a wide array of effects that can take place in terms of adaptation response. The third evolutionary pathway that emerges is hypoxic conditions, hypoxia being a low oxygen environment. Uh, it's been observed that during geomagnetic reversals, the Earth can exude a low oxygen environment. I would assume similar eff effects take place during excursions. And recent research indicates that hypoxia can route tryptophan towards increased tryptamine production. DMT obviously being a tryptamine. So we have to remember that these alterations in Earth's magnetic field, uh, UVB ray increase, hypoxic conditions could also induce increases in genetic variances leading to leaps in evolution. Uh, I believe that there's going to be a subset of the population that can actually adapt a lot more effectively than the rest, and they can actually thrive during these uh, more intense changes to the planet. There's also going to be a subset that gets very sick and dies rather quickly during these alterations to the planet. And most of the, the population is going to fall somewhere in between. So we have to look at it that it's not like all changes to the earth are bad for everyone. They're going to be bad for most, but there's going to be adaptation response. Now on to dietary sources. Obviously, the stone ape theory is based on the notion that our ancestors consumed psilocybin mushroom to induce the changes in our cortex. However, there are some research papers indicating that even citrus plants contain compounds like DMT and bufotenine. Uh, this paper looked at the lemon, orange, mandarin, chinoto, citron, and bergamot plant and found trace amounts of DMT, bufotenine in various levels of the plant as well as the leaves. In addition, uh, the citrus peels have been found to contain monamine oxidase inhibitory properties. Citrawaska, anyone? This study here looks at the fact that there's various uh, common fruits and vegetables that contain monamine oxidase A and monamine oxidase B inhibitory properties. Obviously, monamine oxidase A being key in terms of the ayahuasca brew. This paper here looks at the levels of serotonin, tryptophan, and tryptamine in various fruits and vegetables, kiwi being the highest in terms of tryptamine. Kiwi waska, anyone? It's not that far-fetched when you look at the literature and the fact that there is a paper indicating that uh, the kiwi waska can actually have some sort of effect on our psychological well-being. All right, maybe we're going a little too far, but that's okay. So just in review, the human body possesses endowaska for neurogenesis and neuro neuroplasticity similar to psilocybin. Picomolar range of DMT can induce neuronal growth as cited in the Algernon Pharmaceuticals research. Micro Tesla, Nano Tesla, and Pico Tesla strength magnetic stimulation can induce nonlinear brain activity changes when measured via EEG. You have 10 pole shifts and 20 excursions within the past 2.6 million years. Uh, this is proposed by mainstream media, so I would assume that there's many more pole shifts and excursions we have yet to find. UVB ray increase can induce an adaptive antioxidant response in plants. There's no reason to believe that this can be the case in mammals as well. Lower planetary oxygen levels can upregulate tryptamine production, and fruits and leaves exuded increased DMT and MAOI levels from UVB ray increase, and we consume them and get the benefits from that. So in summary, the endowaska pole shift theory is based on the notion that accelerated geomagnetic fluctuations from pole shifts or excursions induce adaptive responses in the endowaska system leading to 24-7 365 chronic subpsychedelic increases of DMT, 5-MeO, DMT, bufotenine, and all our monamine oxidase inhibitors. So think of it like microdosing for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a nighttime snack. In addition, uh, many food sources experience an increase of DMT, bufotenine, and MAOI properties from UVB rate increase uh, adaptation. So what I'm positing is that the foundation of our evolution is DMT, 5-MeO, bufotenine, harmine, 
tribulin, neurocadin, and pinoline. And then we have our dietary sources of our citric, kiwi, waska, and we have our cherry on top, which would be our psilocybin. So our ancestors had quite the psychedelic Sunday of sorts. What I'm positing is that all of our ancestors have probably had this sort of effect in terms of evolutionary jumps during various points throughout history in which the geomagnetic flations have taken place. So I'm not completely throwing the Stone Ape theory out in terms of uh, evolutionary processes, but I do believe that the endowaska pole shift theory is a bit more comprehensive in terms of uh, the chemicals within us and the factors that can potentially upregulate these chemicals within us to induce that, that growth in our cortex. Uh, the Stone Ape theory, I think it was the best of, of its time with Terence McKenna, but we just have new information now. And that's really what it's about. It's about marrying these in terms of human evolution. And I think Terence would appreciate this. It's not about coming up with a better theory. It's, com it's coming up with an updated theory. So I'd like to dedicate this entire presentation to Terence McKenna. I was supposed to give this presentation at a talk in April 2020, but obviously COVID hit and that talk got canceled. But nevertheless, we're here, Terence, and I salute you and all your work, and I am um, dedicating this talk to you. Oh, you thought we were done? Nope. It gets better, wilder, part two coming soon. We're going to be delving into what appears to be the next evolutionary leap within the human species. We're going to be touching upon various aspects of Graham Hancock's ancient apocalypse series. Some things we find intriguing, while other aspects we will be questioning, obviously with the utmost of respect.